It's a great privilege to introduce uh, Dr. Doug Beck. Uh, Dr. Beck is uh, actually Vice President of Academic Science at Otakon. He's also an adjunct professor of communication disorders and science at State University of New York in Buffalo and the vice chair of cognition in hearing SIG. So uh, Doug, it's great to have you and we really appreciate you taking the time to give us a really interesting talk. So thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure, Bill. Thank you for having me. Uh, I, I was just speaking with Laura and I said, I'm not gonna do a trip down memory lane uh, and, and I speak to people like Daryl Brackman and, and my heart just goes out to these guys because I learned so much. Um, I think of Dr. Brackman as one of my mentors as well as Bill House. I'll share a little bit of that as we go through, but I'll try to stick to science and I'll try to stick to the KJ Lee version of science, which is a, a few, few words and lots of facts. So if we don't dig deeper, nobody else is going to, okay? So I wanna start with that idea that this is gonna be a deep dive. Um, I am a full-time employee at uh, Oticon. I've been with them 17 years, and uh, we, uh, we pride ourselves on making the very best quality products, and that's not just something that I'm going to dribble out there. I'll, I'll give you some examples. This is, uh, I do believe, the last interview published with uh, Dr. William F. House, um, and, and Bill, I know, was a dear friend to uh, Dr. Brackman as well, and to so many people in the room, of course. But uh, if, if you have like 20 minutes with nothing to do, go to William F. House uh, in Google, put in William F. House comma Beck, you'll pull up this interview. It's, it's so much fun to read, uh, unbelievable. When I, was, when I started at House in the early 80s, uh, I was on the Hi-Fi project, which was the precursor to the approved cochlear implant that the uh, FDA approved in uh, 86 for adults. And, and after spending half an hour, an hour with Bill one day, he just sends this note, right? Uh, Dear Doug, I appreciate your spending the time with me to explain the Hi-Fi project. I am very pleased that you're making so much progress with it. And this is just, you know, classic Bill. I mean, I was just out of my CFY. I was a low level uh, researcher and Bill House sends me a personal note. So here we are almost 40 years later. And of course I saved it. Uh, this is his series on acoustic tumors, which he wrote a nice little note in there to Doug, a valued colleague, Bill. I still have that because uh, my career started there and, and is entirely based on exploring and, and not being afraid of the status quo or to change the status quo because of guys like Dr. Daryl Brackman and Dr. Bill House. And so these are my two websites. Um, I will make available the PowerPoint if Laura needs it. Um, but if you want to go to either of my websites, uh, these are uh, chronologically arranged. It's my last 180 or 185 papers, something like that. You'll find them all there. So you have PDFs that are hands out, handouts that um, cover the material in this lecture. Um, uh, so you don't really need to take notes. You've got all the PDFs, but if you need even more, you can certainly go to my website, which is douglaslbeck.com or my Oticon website, which I can't even recite what that says, but, but if you take a picture of it, we'll figure it out. So I want to talk about hearing versus listening versus cognition. And this is what Dr. Brackman and I were just uh, speaking about before we started. Hearing, and, and I know everybody in the room is a neurotologist, I get that, but, but here's the confusion in patients' minds, in many otolaryngologists, family practitioners, GPs, they don't, they don't know this stuff. Hearing is just perceiving sound, that's it, detecting sound, that's hearing. Listening is attributing meaning to sound. Listening is decoding the neural code to make sense of speech. Listening is what separates you and me from all other beings. In other words, when you think about mammals, think about dogs or cats or horses or chimpanzees, uh, orangutans, monkeys, they all have hearing systems that are better than ours. We can hear 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. Your dog, your cat can hear out to 40,000 hertz, maybe 35,000 hertz. So our hearing is not what puts us at the top of the food, um, uh, at the top of the food pyramid, right? What's the term? Uh, the, the reason that we are the very top of the food chain is because of our listening ability. Hearing, humans aren't that good at hearing. Hearing is critically important, clearly, one of the major five senses. And of course, listening is built on hearing. Sounds have to be audible, but that's not enough. 
If the sounds are just audible and you can't make sense of them, you get into situations like auditory processing disorders, auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder, cochlear synaptopathy, traumatic brain injury, blast injury, noise induced hearing. You, you get into ADD, ADHD, you get into all of these areas, dyslexia, where hearing can be quite normal, but the ability to listen is very different. So if you think about the USA, um, what, what we have is about 325 million people. And of those about 37 to 38 million have hearing loss on an audiogram, but there's another 26 million who have no audiometric deficits, yet they will complain of hearing difficulty and or speech and noise problems. So it's important for us to ferret out who's a hearing loss patient, who's a listening disorders patient, because there's 26 million of them, and who has cognitive issues. And I'll talk a little bit about cognition today because it's very important as we're going on and on. And as of course, as we're becoming an older and older population, you know, I'll give you some quick examples. In 1800, the average age at death in the USA was 37. In 1900, the average age of, at death was 55. In 2000, in the USA, it was 78. So we're getting older rapidly. Not, and I know this last year, of course, it went down, but that's because of COVID and all these other things. Um, so, so we are much older um, and working and capable and competent people. But here's the thing. By the time you hit age 80 to 85 in the USA, your chance of having Alzheimer's is about 40%. And that's from the American Alzheimer's Association. So what that means, right, is that when we're seeing these patients who are in their 80s, 85, 90, 95, 100, their chance of having a cognitive disorder is very substantial. And of course, the sound, they're, they're gonna have the exact same complaint. They're gonna say, you know, I do fine with you, doctor, when, when I'm here in the exam room and it's quiet, I understand every word you're saying. But when I'm at dinner with my spouse, my significant other, my grandchildren, I, I can't understand what they're saying. And then it's very easy for them as the patient to say, well, people don't speak clearly. And of course they're gonna say that because that's their perception because they have a mild to moderate sensory neural loss or they have a listening disorder or they have some sort of cognitive decline. Now, the thing about cognitive decline, the CDC and the, health, the HHS will both tell you that cognitive decline is a normal you know, uh, factor associated with aging. So these are the numbers I just gave you. 325 million people in the USA population 38 million with hearing loss on an audiogram, but only, but an, an additional 26 million who will complain of um, hearing difficulty and or speech and noise problems. So what do you do? What's the common thread here between people who might have cognitive issues, maybe dementia, maybe Alzheimer's, maybe 200 other neurocognitive disorders, people with hearing loss and people with um, listening disorders? What's the common thread? Well, in 2002, Mead Killian publishes in Seminars and Hearing that people with normal hearing and normal cognitive ability need 2 dB signal to noise ratio to get half the words correct. But people with a mild to moderate loss need 8 dB. So it's not really that they need it louder. They need a better separation between the primary talker and the background noise. So people with normal hearing and normal cognitive ability need a 2 dB signal to noise ratio to get half the words correct. That's called the SNR 50, the signal to noise ratio to get 50% 50 50 of the words correct. You'll also see in the literature, it's referred to as an SRT 50, the speech reception threshold to get 50% of the words correct based on the signal to noise ratio. This becomes very important because this is the goal of all of these people. It's not to be louder it's to be clearer. So these numbers become remarkably important. And when you think about things like word recognition score, does that really reflect what we're looking at? And the answer is no. Um, even when I was at house back in the early eighties, we, we gave it undue weighting. We, we had the 50, 50 rule and we had, you know, um, 10, 15% uh, changes that we would, we would think of as, as clinically significant. But the research literature back then was fairly clear from the Journal of the American, uh, the Acoustical Society of America, uh, Aaron Thornton and Mike Raffin's paper of 1978 and Gary Lawson in 2012. Um, if you want to find this data, um, 
if you Google Gary Lawson, comma, 2012, comma, Beck, you'll pull up the interview I did with him when I was the um, editor in chief for the American Academy of Audiology. But I wanna give you the example so it hits home. If you use a 25 word digitized stimuli, say the word went, say the word shoe, say the word though, and, and you do it digitized. You can't do it, if, if, if you're doing it monitored live voice, there's no point in doing it. The inaccuracy is stunning. And, and I'll just leave that there because I wanna make a different point. If we use standard medical statistics where we're looking at a 0.05 alpha level, right? And 95% confidence level, here's how it really works. If the first score in the left ear is 88%, the question is, what would be statistically significantly different? Well, the same is 68 to 100. So if somebody has 88% in the first year and the second year score is 76, those are the same. If the second year score is 72, those are the same. And you guys know, I, I, I can almost assuredly tell you that Dr. Luxford or Dr. Brackman or Dr. Slattery, who've been, who've been at this for a while, they'll tell you, yeah, the patient would come back next week and those scores could reverse. And the reason they could reverse is because they were statistically the same to begin with. So, so we need you know, to dig deeper. We need to really understand the math. And, and we, 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 we tend to fall on you know, doing what we've done, but, but we know so much more now than we did when I was there. If you were to use a 50 word digitized list, do you increase the accuracy? Yes, you do, of course. If the first score again is 88% and you're using a 50 word list, now, 74% uh, is the range that would be the same. Uh, so a score of 70 or 72 or 68 would be statistically different. So when we, when we do things you know, with a scientific basis, um, we, we get more accurate results, obviously. So, so I just want to throw that out there because I know that, um, that every single day you guys are looking at word recognition score, which some people still call a speech discrim. It shouldn't be called speech discrim. A discrimination task is can you tell one from the other? This is a recognition task where the, um, the set is infinite and they have to hear it, perceive it and recite it. So that's a recognition task. That's not a discrimination task. So anyway, um, so let's talk about who is a candidate for amplification. And you know, pure tones in and of themselves don't tell you all that much because the reason that we do pure tones and we put so much weight on them, which is critically important. I'm not saying that's an error. I'm saying that's it. That, but the reason that, that we do that is because pure tones line up very, very well with otolaryngologic disease. You know, any of the physicians in the room, any of the audiologists in the room, you can absolutely see a Carhartt notch. It's usually at 2000 Hertz. It could be at 1500, it could be at 3000. But, but you could see that, you can see that airborne gap. You could see asymmetries clearly you could see fluctuating low frequency losses. So it's very important to do pure tones. I am not saying don't do pure tones. I am saying it's not enough because it's ambiguous in that you have 26 million people in the USA who have, um, who have deficits that, that they would describe as hearing difficulty and or difficulty understanding speech and noise. Now the primary authors on that paper, and you do have that paper in the PDFs, that was one that Jeff Danhauer and I wrote. Now Jeff, when I got to the House Ear Institute in 82 or 83, something like that, uh, the uh, director of research was a psychoacoustician named uh, Ed Cudahy. I, I, Ed was great. I don't know what happened to him. I lost track a long time ago. But Jeff Danhauer was a professor of audiology at UCSB. And Jeff was our primary consultant on the cochlear implant projects uh, before it was FDA approved. So I, got, I had the honor of working with Jeff. And, and we used to think about things like, speech sounds only versus visual only versus combining auditory and visual, what would that do? And, and you know, we were just on the cusp of really understanding it, you know, almost 40 years ago. But, but what we realize now is that when we look at just pure tones, they don't tell us enough because a pure tone is just a detection or a perception of a sound. What we wanna know is the end result, is how is their brain able to use it? Because when you think about pure tone audiometry, right? Um, malleus incus uh, stapes, oval window, outer hair cells, inner hair cells, basilar membrane, synapse, eighth nerve, brain stem, lateral meniscus, medial geniculate, inferior collicula, and then contralateral pathways, right? That's what we think about. And we think, so if the right ear is stimulated here, most of it's in the left, right? And uh, superior temporal lobe, Heschel's gyrus, Brodmann area 41, 42. Some of it crosses anterior commissure, some goes uh, corpus callosum. So we get both sides involved. 
And that's correct, that's good, but there's so much more. I mean, right now you're watching me, right? So the occipital lobe is totally involved in this conversation. Some of you are realizing that, that, um, that you like my tie. So, so you have a warm and fuzzy feeling to my tie. So that's your amygdala, your emotional centers involved. Then your, your hippocampus is involved because you have to decode these words from, from long-term memory into working memory to follow this discussion. So the whole brain is involved. And what we know is the pure tones, of course, if, if somebody has a pure tone loss, um, you know, that's, that's a problem. But, but my point is we should be looking for much more. I, I think we're leaving patients on the table. I think what, what we're doing is we're looking for those with obvious hearing loss and those are the ones that we're mostly treating. But I'll show you some fantastic work that, that these other 26 million and perhaps many people with cognitive decline, dementia, other forms of neurocognitive disorders would benefit from an improved signal to noise ratio. In fact, best practices by AAA, by ASHA, by the IHS, by the British Society of Audiology, all of them say pure tones are not enough. In fact, they, they urge listening and communication assessments to determine candidacy for hearing aid amplification. And it's based on things like the COSI, which is the client-oriented scale of intervention, the HHIE, hearing healthcare inventory for elderly, HHIA for adults, the SSQ, speech and spatial qualities, the IOI, international outcomes inventory, the AFAB, abbreviated profile hearing aid benefit. Those are the things that tell us where is the patient in their journey, right? And, and how are they doing in the life that they're living? Because pure tones are a detection task. And it's very important because we do want a otolaryngologic diagnosis, you know, rule number one, right? Diagnose before treating and, and cause no harm and all these other things that are so incredibly important. So we have to know their pure tones, but that's not enough for audiology. That's not enough to really impact positively their ability to listen. Because when you think of it, the main goal of amplification is to improve the signal to noise ratio. It's really not to make things louder. And in fact, most of the patients who you're gonna see in your career, they're gonna tell you, well, I was doing okay. I got the hearing aids. Yeah, they work, but oh my gosh, they're so loud when I'm in a difficult listening. Exactly. They don't really want it louder. They want it clearer. They want improved signal to noise ratio. Now, the thing is, um, of course, sound has to be audible first. So rule number one is hearing, but that's not, that's not the end game. The end game is listening. So we wanna make sounds clearer. That's the most sought, sought after goal. When patients come to see you, you know, 98% of them are gonna tell you the reason I'm here is I can't understand in difficult listening situations. I can't understand speech. And that stuff is so important, but you look at their audiogram and you say, oh, well, that's, that's what, no, that's, that's not at all the whole picture. Here's the thing. When you think about people who have a precipitous loss, normal hearing out to 4K or 3K, and then it drops off like, like a bad transmission, right? It goes to 110 dB. Well, a lot of these people don't even know that they have hearing loss because their brain is so good, they're able to make sense out of what they're hearing, so they don't realize the deficit at all. A lot of people with mild to moderate loss will never seek help. In fact, the national statistics on that are that one out of three to one out of six, depends who you read. But what, let's suppose it's one out of five. One out of five people who have mild to moderate sensory neural loss never seek help. And it's not because hearing aids are too expensive. It's not because they're unattractive. It, it's, you know, it's because they don't really perceive that they have a problem. So how do we overcome that? Well, to determine if they have a problem, the most important factor may very well be a speech and noise test, which by the way, only takes about two or three minutes. Um, I, I wrote a speech noise test in 2019 with a colleague of mine, Dr. Lauren Benitez, and it's called a two minute speech and noise test. It was published by the AAA and they can use, uh, they don't have to buy anything. You know, you already have everything you need to do it. You know, um, so these tests are very, very important to do a speech and noise test because that tells you how is the patient doing in the environment, in the real world in which they live. And pure tones in a sound booth under TDH 39s or with inserts, it's, it's almost unrelated to the life they live. But a speech and noise test totally represents that. So um, they don't come to see us because they have hearing loss. They come to see us primarily, and yeah, I know some do, of course they do, but most don't. Most come to see us because they wanna better understand speech and noise. They want to accomplish clarity. And that's almost always done by improving the signal to noise ratio.
So that's a vast overview. I want to give you a couple of specifics. Hearing aids up until 2021 were built on you know, traditional sound processors, <coughs> excuse me, sound processors, which went from analog to digital about 25 years ago. The next step in this evolution is deep neural networks. And I'm going to teach you all about deep neural networks in 90 seconds or less. Or I'll just give you greatest hints. Uh, artificial intelligence, you're familiar. It's almost a meaningless term. We've all been using it for 25 years. Uh, machine learning is going that way. So you could have artificial intelligence or machine learning that could be as simple as the thermostat in your house, right? Artificial intelligence. When it hits uh, 74 degrees, you bring it back down to 72. Artificial intelligence. Machine learning could be as simple as a hearing aid when the sounds get louder, maybe 70, 75 dB, 80 dB SPL, it engages noise reduction. But deep neural networks are the smartest of all artificial intelligence. They are the most sophisticated and they are based on vast quantities of data. Let me give you an example of deep neural networks in biology and deep neural networks in technology. A deep neural network in biology is how you learned to walk and talk. You listened, you had sensory input for 12 to 18 months. You had vast quantities of input to your eyes, to your vestibular system, to your muscles, to your, your brain stem, uh, to your ears. And then slowly your brain organizes all that information and we really don't know how. And, and then it starts to make sense of it. And you start to say mama or dada, and you start to crawl and walk. That is a deep neural network in biology. Fish learn to swim, birds learn to fly, no written instructions, no algorithms. Deep neural networks. Now, deep neural networks look for patterns and they organize the information and they use a best fit outcome. Now, of course, and I'm not gonna get real commercial on you, but I do want you to know that Oticon came out with this on a chip about uh, two months ago, we introduced it and, and it's doing tremendously well. That hearing aid is trained on 12 million speech samples. So what that means is we're not just setting tone and loudness and fine. The, the hearing aid before it was commercially available, it was trained on 12 million speech samples of quiet noise, different voices, different accents, different background sounds to say, this is what we want. And in a deep neural network, it self checks. When you pronounce a word correctly, your mom or dad said, oh, very good. Yeah, that's right. Or they gave you a lollipop or something. When you learn to walk, they go, oh, come here, come here, quick. Right, and, and so it's very encouraging. Deep neural networks in technology do the same thing. They self-check the output to make sure that it, it represents maximally the input. How is this using technology? Well, facial recognition. Um, speech recognition, hey Siri, what time is it, right? And, and that's, that's a deep neural network. But also when you think about things like self-driving cars, deep neural networks. When you think about Amazon uh, telling you, okay, Doug, you bought this shirt, so you might like this shirt. Or Netflix saying, okay, so you watch that movie, you might like this deep neural networks. That's how that stuff is done. So that's all I'm gonna tell you about that. But deep neural network in a hearing aid allows you to have improved selective attention. So as you're probably familiar, hearing aids in 2021, to a large extent, use directional, 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 or beam forming. So you're making the, the scene smaller, 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 and then you compress the heck out of it. Some hearing aid settings might be three to one. So if my voice right now fluctuates by 30 dB, and you set a, a, a compression ratio of three to one, it's only gonna give you the patient 10 dB. So th the dynamics are really crushed in terms of the azimuth that the hearing aid is perceiving and in terms of compression and, and what we're taking away. When you use a deep neural network, the compression is six, it has a higher resolution times six. When you're using a deep neural network, you're getting improved speech and noise because the hearing aid before you even set it up for the patient has been trained on speech and noise. Um, when you look at these kinds of products and, and um, I'll, I'll show you some of the peer reviewed stuff we've published on this already. So selective attention is the ability to understand who you want to understand in the situation you're in. And, and it allows you to switch your attention to different people speaking. Because what we're talking about here is an improved neural code. When we, when we close down the neural code, when we give it less 
directional information. When we give it less dynamic uh, amplitude information, the neural code that's going up to the brain has less information in it. Well, what we started doing in 2016 is to open it all up. In fact, our product line at the time was called Open. And, and that was the idea is to give the, the brain a very, very rich neural code. Think about this, when you were like 14, 15, 16, if you had normal hearing back then, you were able to uh, look right at me, yet pay attention to Dr. Slattery, who might be 90 degrees to my right, because I can't tell where your brain is trying to attend. Um, I can see it visually, right? Because you have um, you know, your third, your fourth, your sixth cranial nerve, you have your, your pupil dilating and, and getting smaller based on the lighting and how much attention you, so, and I can tell where, you, where your head is facing. So I can see your visual attention, but I can't see your auditory attention, which is selective attention. And here's an example of that. This, this is one of my favorites. If, if Dr. Brackman is speaking from one meter away from my right ear, and if I were to put a probe mic in my right ear and a probe mic in my left ear, and then measure the sound at five, six, and 7,000 hertz, the difference between my right and left ear, 20 to 22 decibels. Now, very few audiologists or ENTs uh, would get that right. They think it's two or three dB because that's the total speech sound. But your brain is really, really good at figuring this stuff out. So when that sound at five, six, seven thousand hertz in the upper consonants, right? When that's louder at your right ear, that tells me Dr. Brackman's on my right side. So I turn to the right. Also, you have cues like interoral timing differences. So Dr. Brackman is speaking here on my right. Well, it hits my right ear first and then my left. So that's right, uh, head related transfer function or head shadow means the same thing. But, but so you have all these cues in the real world that your brain can handle a better neural code if only we supply it. And what we've done for the first you know, 115 years of hearing aid is try to reduce it to just that primary talker, just focus on that. And if we can do that really well, the presumption is the brain will do fine with it. And as we all know, the brain doesn't do so fine with it because the brain is looking for more. The brain wants a packed neural code so it can pick and choose what it wants to pay attention to. That's this whole idea here of orient, give it all of the information, let the brain focus um, on the primary talker versus the background, and then it can recognize. Again, we talk about uh, word recognition scores, the ability to have a novel acoustic signal and to apply meaning to it. So I, I wanna show you some fun stuff because I, I know I don't have that long left here. Um, F1 and F2, those are foreground speaker number one, foreground speaker number two. Uh, the magenta in the middle, that's you and me sitting there in the chair, one at a time. B1, B2, B3, B4, those are background babble, four talker babble coming from four different speakers. Now keep in mind that I told you in 2002, Mead Killian in seminars and hearing published, people with normal hearing need a 2 dB signal to noise ratio to get 50% of the words correct. People with a mild to moderate loss need eight. The people in this experiment were given three. They had mild to moderate sensory neural loss and they were giving it a very, very challenging test, three dB signal to noise ratio. So that's a normal speech envelope as uh, F1 and F2 are speaking. And then you have the babble all around them. And they're told to focus on uh, either the F1 or the F2 person, the, the foreground talker. So you do a 64 channel EEG on that. And, uh, you know, that looks like this, which means there's nothing you're going to get out of this because it's, it's crazy busy. But we could, of course, synthesize this down digitally, which we did. And then it looks like this. So you take this EEG and you look to see, well, how well does your hearing aid, how, how well does the hearing aid capture the sound scene in the acoustic environment such that the EEG is has a representation of that acoustic sound scene? So if you look at the top one, well, that one just doesn't correlate. So the EEG in a speech and noise situation um, looks like the one on the left. And, and you overlay these hearing aid uh, traces on it. And the top one just really doesn't do anything for you. You know, it's, a, it's almost a totally different signal. But you take that one on the right, and that is correlated. So now we start to think about things differently. Uh, like with the Oticon More product, what we're doing is we're, we're actually making these statements and, and you know, these are, you don't make these statements lightly. You, you have to have proof like what I just showed you. The strength of the early EEG aided 
versus, so aided is, is tricky. What we did is we took the deep neural network turned on and the same hearing aid with the deep neural network turned off. That's the MSI, more sound intelligence on, more sound intelligence off versus our previous very best product. Now, Otakon has been making hearing aids for 116 years. So we're getting pretty good at this. Um, Open Sound Navigator was our previous best product. So if you look at the EEG results with our best newest deep neural network hearing aid off versus on, you get a 60% better representation at the brain as measured by the EEG compared to it being off. So it is indeed giving you some very, very useful information that is reflected by your EEG. And it was 30% better than our previous product. So I'll show you that one more time. I know that's difficult to get your, your arms around it. So this is the thing. You take an EEG of speech and noise, 64 channel EEG. You synthesize that to a usable tracing, much like you know an ABR. If you do raw ongoing ABR, good luck, right? But if you look at just the first 10 milliseconds, and, and you know, you're using the best information, you can see an ABR trace pretty readily. Well, then you compare that to the speech envelope of speech and noise, and you're looking to see which one correlates. Well, that would be a traditional sort of a hearing aid. And this is when we use a deep neural network. So we, we, we're onto something here. And we do have uh, published results, which, um, which are pretty important. I'll, I'll give you a brief overview of that. I'm, I'm gonna take about eight or nine more of your minutes and then I'll let you run. One of the other things we looked at with Open More was could we improve memory or recall? So this really easy sentences. Um, so if I say to Dr. Slattery, Bill, please say the last word in these sentences. So I say, the team lost the match, match. The lady hurt her arm, arm. Easy peasy, right? But then when he's done with all seven sentences, I say, okay, Dr. Slattery, tell me all of the last words. That's where the rubber meets the road. And what we found there is that when patients were trying to go from a short-term memory, like you know, 15, maybe 30 seconds to long-term memory and recall that, we even found that when we fit them with a deep neural network, we improved by 16% their ability to recall those last words. And this is based on a trial of about 30 patients, if I'm not mistaken. So, um, so we do have white papers on this stuff. Uh, I just published a paper last month. This is in um, Journal of Otolaryngology ENT Research on Deep Neural Networks, Hearing and Listening. And, you know, the, the, the big question of the day, I think what most of us are starting to deal with patients is, can we intervene on patients who have cognitive issues or perhaps dementia? You know, so beyond sensory neural loss, beyond people with listening disorders, do we have any impact when it comes to people with cognitive disorders? So the most famous study on this was Amoeba's, well, Frank Lenz in 2011, 2012 from Johns Hopkins, brilliant. That was a great study. And I remember when that came out and, and I think I actually called Frank and congratulated him because it was so clever. But in 2015, Amoeba from Bordeaux, France, uh, looked at 3,670 people over 25 years. And she grouped them thusly. I, I never get to say the word thusly anymore. So she grouped them one, group one had uh, reported hearing loss, but no hearing aid use. Group two, hearing loss and hearing aid use, group three, no hearing loss. And what she found grossly was that uh, addressing one's hearing loss through hearing aids may slow cognitive decline by alleviating communication difficulties, of course, and improving mood and social interactions. What she means by that is we know that people with substantial hearing loss tend to socially isolate. Now, you've probably read about this in the 2017 Lancet by Livingston and colleagues, where they said, you know, Two thirds of your dementia risk is genetic. It's based on your deoxyribonucleic acids. But one third of your dementia risk, which now they say 40%, is based on things like alcoholism, drug abuse, social isolation, less education, um, air pollution, hearing loss. And hearing loss, by the way, is the largest of all of those things that, are, that can be changed. Uh, hearing loss is a 9% PAF, according to the Lancet, and that's a population attributable factor. <coughs> Excuse me. So can we intervene? Well, amoeba seemed to imply yes. Now, you got to be careful with this study because uh, Dr. Amoeba, although I love her and I think it was a brilliant study based on 3,670 people, they self-elected. So the question was, do you have hearing loss? Yes. We don't know if it was mild, moderate, severe, or profound, and we don't know if it was a listening disorder or hearing loss, but 
it is what it is. Then when they fit people with hearing aids, we don't know if it was one, we don't know if it was two, we don't know what algorithm they used, we have no idea who fit them. So, so the gross trend is exactly as she said, addressing one's hearing loss earlier may help slow cognitive decline. But since 2015, a lot has happened. Deal et al. in 2017 did do a random control study, uh, people 70 to 84 years, and found that you could put them in rehab with hearing aids or rehab without hearing aids. And this is peer-reviewed stuff. The, the group that had hearing aids, um, there was an improvement in their cognitive domain for memory. And the ones without, there was no change. And this is gonna be a large study coming out in 2022 called the ACHIEVE study. And, and I'll be happy to talk to you about that when it comes out. Jafari and colleagues in 2019 peer reviewed hearing amplifications, um, partially restores hearing ability of course and improves overall cognitive function in older adults. But this is the most important study. This is Amoeba's newest study, came out uh, just about one year ago today, as a matter of fact, it was March of uh, 2020. The available data globally supports the hypotheses, still hypotheses, that hearing aids have a positive impact on long-term cognition in older adults suffering from hearing loss. My favorite study is Hannah Glick and Anu Sharma. They published this in Frontiers of Neuroscience. And if you want the quick version of this, in February 2021, I'm sorry, February 2020, Anu Sharma and I um, published an interview that I did with Anu Sharma, the second author of this study in Hearing Review. So you can get it easily, put in Hearing Review, comma, Sharma, comma, Beck, you'll pull this up. And, and what they did, they looked at cross modal plasticity. So you know the theory, right? That if, if, I, if, if I have hearing loss, my superior temporal lobes are not getting a full complement of sound. So my brain can't act on it. So what happens is that part of the superior temporal lobe that used to perceive sound isn't doing that. So another part of the brain might get it. That's called cross modal plasticity. Could be the sensory motor strip, could be the occipital lobe. Um, so, um, oh, I'm sorry, wrong. Uh, Wrong slide. So age-related hearing loss is associated with cognitive decline and functional and structural brain changes. Well, they, they fit their patients actually with Oticon products for six months and they saw a reversal in that cross-modal reorganization. Now that should be pretty striking to you because these patients only had a mild loss. So her point was, you know, that maybe a mild loss you wouldn't fit. Maybe their cozy score wasn't so bad. Maybe... They, but, but maybe is it in their long-term interest to fit them regardless, because maybe you can put their brain back how it was before they had any hearing loss at all. Maybe, not saying it happens one-to-one -one every time. Well, no, nope, certainly doesn't. And we don't even know the demographics of the most susceptible patients. That is, we don't know, are, are they gonna be diabetic, pre-diabetic, have nothing to do with diabetes. Maybe these are people with uh, a history of smoking. Maybe these are people in the upper socioeconomic uh, group. Maybe these are people at the lower. Maybe these are, we don't know. These are just, you know, brand new studies. So my interpretation of all of these studies, which I put in um, one of the papers that you have, despite emerging reports of benefit of delayed degradation of cognition via amplification, we're only at the beginning of our understanding of these relationships. Much more information is required to make definitive causal statements. It appears increasingly clear that we're not gonna have those statements this year or next year. Uh, the evidence does show that for those patients who choose to identify and take action for their age-related hearing loss, there may, they may also be positively impacting their age-associated age cognitive trajectory and possibly reducing their incidence of dementia. I mean, we, we just don't know, we certainly can't promise, but there's a whole lot of really good studies indicating that, that, that that's probable in many patients. So here's my closing slide. Access to the brain through audition is essential to maximal brain development. The brain can only organize itself based on the stimuli received. The degree of hearing loss does not determine the functional outcome. The functional outcome is based on the technology that you and I choose. So that's all I've got for you. I mean, I, I'd love to speak to you for another seven or eight hours, but I don't think that's gonna happen. You have busier schedules than I do. Hello, my name is Dr. Kevin Peng, Neurotologist here at the House Institute. Thank you for watching this video. The House Institute provides free educational videos for hearing health professionals worldwide. 
To help support videos like these and other educational efforts, please consider donating by clicking the link in the description box below. Your generous support allows us to keep videos like these at no cost for you and others. Thank you.